Good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. This is BRN AM for Tuesday, February 13th, 2024. And our top story today, what's driving higher fast food prices? Joining me now to help break it down, Dave Anderson is an economist with Texas A&M University. David, it's always great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us in the program this morning. You too. Thanks for having me out with you today. Yeah, we appreciate it. And we know how busy you are. You Not only do you teach uh, graduate economics, but also you're traveling to different associations and talking about what we're going to talk about today, which is the market as it relates to food. Dave, I, you know, I don't know if you've been to your local fast food restaurant. I certainly have not necessarily gone out to fast food, but I've seen restaurants and the prices are really uh, astronomical. I mean, a, a basic burger from McDonald's, is, for an example, is $18. Um, Want to get your reaction to that? And then we can talk about the who, the how, the why. Yeah, well, you know, I think my first reaction is, you know, costs are higher, prices are higher. And in fact, you know, like you said, you know, sometimes you go to, to a place and prices are shockingly high, uh, particularly if you don't go very often and you remember what it used to be. <laughs> then I think we're all been in for a pretty rude shock, I think. Uh, and as you notice, you know, that uh, $18 McDonald's or a uh, 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 Big Mac meal uh, at that one uh, McDonald's location, that's pretty shockingly high. And, and uh, you know, how do you go there with your family if that's what the price is? It's pretty, pretty tough, I think. Yeah, I think it makes, it makes a big dent in anyone's pocket, but especially those maybe who are struggling with inflation. Dave, what I'd like to do, I mean, you are an economist by trade. You have a lot of experience in agricultural and food. I want to break down some of these expenses. So let, let's talk about, we're not going to pick on McDonald's. I just use them as an example. They're not a sponsor. Right. I'm not advocating for people to go out and get Big Macs or not. Uh, but let, <laughs> let's, I, I like kind of like a Big Mac from time to time, although $18 would make me think twice about that. But let's talk about what goes into the cost of the Big Mac or the burger or the, for any restaurant. So let's start with labor. Uh, let's start with labor. because That's a big part. You need to hire people to produce the Big Mac, take the raw materials, put it together. Let's talk about those uh, wages. How are, how are we doing in terms of wages at some of these fast food restaurants? Well, we certainly see wages that are going up and, and across, across the entire economy. Uh, and we certainly see uh, even where some states have passed laws to increase their minimum wage. Uh, yet sometimes those minimum wage laws, by the time those have been passed, actual minimum wages at at places, restaurants and all, are actually higher than that already. Uh, and so we might question, you know, what's actually going on there. But certainly that becomes uh, something easy to cite or note in as, as we look into, you know, why are costs higher? Certainly labor costs are higher. And you know, But, you know, one of the things I always try to remind myself, you know, certainly that's a significant portion of costs you know, of delivering an item. Uh, but I also try to remind myself that higher wages are also somebody who's working there making more money, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, but it, if we're looking at the cost of this item, costs are higher than they used to be. Right. Uh, so that's certainly part of it. And that's a significant portion of the total cost of, say, that hamburger. Uh, and in fact, many times the underlying agricultural commodity price, the beef, the, the wheat into the, the bun, uh, many times those are a very small percent of the total cost. And so we often see those cited as well, commodity prices are higher. They may be, but typically that's a very small portion of what the overall cost is. The building, keeping the lights on, uh, you know, everything else associated with that are typically larger than that underlying commodity. Yeah, let's, we're gonna talk about the commodity and the food I think in the second segment, but okay. it, but you're, no, I, I'm glad you brought it up, but I want to also talk about the automation that has been going on. So a lot of the people that look at the cost, they say, okay, you, you need people to create the burger. Maybe you can do some of that automation, but when I go into a McDonald's or a Taco Bell, it's been a little bit of time. I, I go to McDonald's for coffee from time to time. There's now a, um, a kiosk. And so you don't necessarily need a person to take the order. You can input it. You can put your card in. And five minutes later, 10 minutes later, your food comes out. So does that automation help reduce some of that labor expense that is a big part of this uh, hamburger price? Well, I think it does. But what it really does is transfer the cost from 
labor to, you know, to use old economist term, to capital. So what I've done is I've invested money in these, whether it's robotics or automation, these things, that's a, it's still costly. There's still a set of costs. And, and as labor costs go up, these other uh, things, automation, uh, become more cost competitive. I, you know, and I think another big part of that is not is is not necessarily the labor cost, but it's just their uh, availability, the uh, reliability of labor. And you know, it's nothing new that we've often talked about a really a shortage of workers, a shortage of labor in the U.S. in a lot of industries, and that's that's nothing new since the pandemic. Uh, and so as we have a shorter, uh, excuse me, a shortage of workers where we can't get workers uh, simply because they aren't there, uh, you know, what do we do? Well, we other automation, whatever, becomes a more effective alternative. And so we see more of that. The kiosk, the, the app. Uh, with a lot, I mean, so many places you can order your stuff on the app and you just pop in and pick it up. You yeah. know, another thing's even in the back of, of fast food restaurants, you know, you you know, you might watch them take take a big cup and they press the big cup button, you know, and, and it automatically fills it to the proper level for the size of drink you've ordered. And so, you know, all of those things work to uh, try to alleviate really a tight labor market. Yeah, and, and and just to build on that, and then I want to go to the capital expense of having a restaurant before we go to commercial break. But if you have a shortage of workers, you have to do an incentive, either automate, or you need an incentive like greater wages, uh, better benefits, so a 401k, a 401k match, uh, health benefits. I mean, all that is baked into what I would call labor costs or compensation. I'm not an, I'm not an economist by you, but like you, but you know I did go to. It is that is that little... total compensation uh, to get that person to come in, and 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 one of the things too is that that you know higher wages, higher total compensation does attract people into the labor market, uh, and and that's that's sort of how markets work too. Is if I, I want to attract more. In I I and, and they're not there now. I gotta pay them more, yeah. or I gotta compete with another business to bid those workers away from them. And so, in this overall labor market, we we see all of that at work. Yeah, and, and David, last question before we go to commercial break. Let's talk about the restaurant itself. I think you alluded to this in your original comment to my first question. There's an expense to maintaining the actual restaurant, so the property. Uh, pre presumably, you've got to maintain that. You've got to uh, clean it. It's got to be subject to certain uh, governmental regulations. Make sure it's clean. You know, you get this score of at least in New York, you get the score of A, B, C, D, F, right? From the the nutrition or the not nutrition. What do you call them? The, uh, uh, the, the health, I know. Department. health department. There you, go. No. <laughs> you know, it's an early it's an early morning, but but yeah. that's that's the expense of maintaining the restaurant. And you can say. Uh, it you know it's built like a box. It's very genericized in terms of how they offer it, and I I agree. But that's another expense as well because taxes in some some local towns and cities have gone up. They have, and so you know, particularly if let's say you're going to build a new location, land costs are higher, uh, construction costs are higher, uh, all of those things, and putting that you know that building there making the product, delivering it to the customer who walks in the door, all of those costs are higher. Uh, and, and, you know, too, with higher interest rates, uh, those affect all of those costs as well. Because, you know, I would probably argue that plenty of businesses have to borrow money, uh, whether it's long-term borrowing uh, for the building and things like that, or short-term operating. Uh, Costs are higher in that regard, too. And so as costs go up, you know, they've got to try to figure out how can I price this product where customers will still come in and buy it, yet I can create a profitable business or continue a profitable business. And so all of that works to, to raise those prices that we see. Yeah, absolutely. Dave, as I said, I need to take a very quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the price of beef and some of the underlying elements that actually go into the burger. You're going to want to stay tuned right here on BRN AM. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, 
and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses, I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But well, you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Well, Dave, thanks so much for staying with us. Really appreciate you hanging around for segment number two this morning. Hey, great to be with you. And I'm not going to pick on McDonald's now. I'm going to talk. Uh, do you remember Where's the Beef, the Where's the Beef campaign? <laughs> Clara Pell, I think was the name of the woman. Um, long, I think that's right. Long yeah. gone. She would say, where's the beef? So I think that was, was that was that Burger King or Wendy's? I don't remember. I think that was a Wendy's ad. It was a Wendy's commercial. So that was, that was a great ad and, and she got a lot of fame. Um, all right, let's talk about the price of the materials that go in. So we talked about labor, capital costs, like uh, the restaurant, maintaining the restaurant, the price of labor to build the restaurant, all that kind of stuff. Now let's talk about the ingredients. Let's start with cattle. You 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 speak regularly. This is an area of expertise for you. Uh, let's talk about the beef uh, that's in that patty. Where where do we stand with beef prices lately? Well, overall, beef prices are higher, and and it's really driven by a, a supply side uh, idea. We're We've got fewer cows in the U.S. In fact, USDA released a cattle inventory report just last week that showed we had the fewest number of cattle in the U.S. since 1951. And so, uh, but I, I think one of the keys is we have an industry that's much more productive than it used to be. So while we have uh, fewer cattle, we produce more beef per animal. But overall, uh, we're producing less beef, and it's really driven by drought in much of the U.S. that has forced ranchers to sell off some of their cattle. So that's reduced uh, uh, animals. It's also a reaction to what were very low cattle prices that really were below many producers' costs. And so you're not going to make up those losses on volume. So so we've cut our herds there as well. And it's really this, this uh, interaction of uh, the environment that we're in, drought, uh, and economics. And so ranchers, producers were producing less beef. And so from a supply standpoint, that pushes prices higher. On the other side, we've also had very good demand for beef by consumers. Uh, I, I would argue, you know, consumers like the product. Folks like beef. Uh, and, and a lot of the demand has been driven by what I'm going to call higher and higher quality grades. USDA grades beef. So when you go to your grocery store, you would see prime or you might see choice or select, and that's the quality grade. It's all the same quality safety-wise. Everything is inspected. But what that is is a measurement largely of marbling, intermuscular fat, and fat delivers a lot of great things like taste and juiciness and flavor and things like that. And folks like a higher quality grade. So we've had very good demand coupled with tighter supplies, and that's a recipe for higher prices. Yeah, and people just, as a result, they see the higher prices, they still go out uh, either buying the, the meat or they're going out to the McDonald's regardless if it's 18 bucks. <laughs> I mean, they, they have been. And so it, it, it's, you know, I don't know if it's a function of they just want to eat or they just like the burger. Let's talk about some of the things that you build around uh, for the, the burger. You got tomatoes, you got lettuce, you got pickles, you got onions, you got the bun. Um, 
without getting into too many weeds here, pun intended, uh, what about the price of those condiments, you know, the mustard, the ketchup, the mayo, plus the other things I just mentioned? Yeah, I, I think some of those are pretty interesting. For one, we might look at the at the bun, for instance. Uh, and and there's a there's an old statistic where some folks at USDA went into and they looked at the price of they took the price of bread and they figured out how much wheat went into that loaf of bread. And there was actually more money in the packaging than there was in the wheat that it required to bake the loaf of bread. And so, you know, even in something like the bun, the, the, the wheat part is a very small portion of the total amount. Again, just like a restaurant, you know, we've got we've got to mill the wheat, we've got to turn it into flour, we've got to bake it, we've got people involved in all of that, and we got to truck it to where all of us customers are going to buy it. And so there's a lot of other costs in there, uh, but that's dependent also on, you know, the underlying cost on, uh, gosh, drought where we produce wheat, high fertilizer prices. We're going to have to fertilize the crop. And so as those costs go up, those basic costs of production and uh, environmental factors, like are you in drought or not, uh, affect yields, which then affect prices. So really across all of our uh, uh, those commodities, you know, where we produce fruits and vegetables, what's the What's the weather like in the growing season? Do we have drought? Have we had floods? Those contribute to a lot of volatility in prices. And I'd point out something else too. You know, we import uh, a lot of fruits and vegetables in the U.S. Uh, in fact, you know, we for for some items we import way more than we produce ourselves, and it's because we just don't produce as much of that. We get it from other places. We get a lot of fruits and vegetables from Mexico. And so when we when we this broader discussion of the, of the border and how we control the border and what comes in and uh, you know the uh, how fast it can get through the border through the inspection processes all of that affects prices and costs for many of the fruits and vegetable items that we sure like a lot. Well, you know, just to cut, cut, cut and I appreciate that, David. I think this has been a very thoughtful discussion. I, I think a lot of people. No, no, it's good. That's good. And I want to I want to kind of close out with your thoughts about we know that the Fed has said that inflation has been tamped down. I think they're looking potentially. I think the March rate cuts off the table. Um, I think the uh, the May rate rate cut may be off the table. But how do we bring these costs down further? Because if you're a McDonald's, a Taco Bell, a Burger King, any of these restaurants, you want customers. You only make money when customers come in. So it's not like you don't want uh, them to come in. You don't want to exclude anybody who doesn't have income. They want lower costs because it brings in more customers, which drives profitability. So could we see, well, can we see lower costs in 2024? Can we see the price of that McDonald's hamburger, Big Mac, we were talking about throughout the, sh the program, come down over time in 2024? Well, I think, you know, if we look at the, at the data that's out there on retail prices and the various uh, components of the consumer price index across food, we see those declining. Really, for the last six months, those those prices are coming down. Now, the level's a lot higher than it used to be, as, as I think we're all aware. But but those the, the prices are actually falling for for most food items, particularly meat, dairy, things like that, they're actually coming down. So that's a positive. Uh, you know, on the on the feed side, what we feed livestock, uh, we have corn prices that are dropping dramatically compared to uh, a year ago, but it's because we produced a record large crop last year. And so we've got abundant supplies. And so that cost component is coming down. Uh, you know, one of the ways we get lower prices is, uh, you know, the dry, using interest rates and things like that by the Fed to try to slow the economy to pull down prices. You know, you could you could bring down prices by forcing a recession, uh, and then nobody has any money to spend. And yeah. gosh, yeah, it brings down the price level, but gosh, that's tough medicine, right? And it so, uh, you know, the, it becomes this balancing act of how do we get this right? You know, really to. Uh, uh, but, there, you know, on the other side, I, I would say, you know, there's a lot of good things in the economy, it seems like. grow. We have a growing economy. GDP, gross domestic product, is growing. Uh, inflation rates are coming down. Uh, unemployment's pretty darn low. 
uh, and real wages are increasing. And so, you know, that really is a, a lot of positive stuff, uh, even though we know, well, gosh, we've got higher interest rates than we used to because we've had inflation. Uh, and so we have higher prices than we used to have. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes it's it's worth trying to remember that I think there's a lot of positive in the economy, too, that that certain, you know, a growing economy helps all of us <laughs> better, than, a lot better than the other way. Uh, you're right. A rising tide lifts all ships, I think uh, President Kennedy said, and that couldn't be more clear. And it's really easy to demonize one aspect without unpacking like we just did for about 20 minutes. Uh, what goes well, into the talk? Go ahead, Dave. I can point out one other thing. If we dig into some of the price, the price data, the consumer price index data, one of the things we see is the price uh, or the, the CPI for, for food at home is coming down into widening gap to food away from home. So, you know, cooking dinner at home is becoming relatively cheaper than eating out. And so what does that do? That probably drives us to eating at home more, going to the grocery store more, eating out less, uh, which works to bring those costs uh, back more in line with each other. Absolutely. It, it is a multiple dimensional uh, variable equation. David, we're going to have to leave oh, it there. Right. It is whack-a-mole. It is whack. I, in some ways, I feel for Jerome Powell, and other other ways, I I don't. David, That's a tough job. I think I like my job. I like my job a lot better too. Less scrutiny. Well, I have scrutiny, but not not like he does. David, great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us, and we look forward to having you back on the program again very soon. Thanks a lot, Jeffrey. And that wraps up this episode of BRN AM. Have a topic of interest, someone you think we should talk to? Drop us a line, and don't forget for all the latest curated news in lifestyle, wellness, finance, tech. So much more and all in one place. Check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. Want to search our archives, check out our latest content, then visit our website. We're back again tomorrow with another edition of BRNAM. We'll have a very special guest. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes. Now is your opportunity to co-create content around any topic on the first lifestyle and wellness network. Reach a global audience through our platform and co-own exclusive branded content. All of our programs are available on demand and also as audio only podcasts so you can take us on the go. Broadcast Retirement Network, available anytime, anywhere, and on any device.